Hi, I'm Elizabeth Bowman, and this is the Opera Glasses Podcast. Today, I am honored to have acclaimed bass baritone Gerald Finley here. He is Grammy winning. He is one of the great dramatic interpreters of our time. He's equally talented on the opera stage as he is on the recital stage, and he is coming to Toronto. He will sing one of his signature roles, Bluebeard, in Bella Bartok's Bluebeard's Castle. This is a reimagined version with an English libretto by Daisy Evans, who is also directing the show. The work has been reframed as a love story between a long married couple living with dementia. I'm looking forward to hearing more about this project, so let's get started. Okay, well, welcome to the Opera Glasses podcast. Thanks for being here. I'm delighted, excited, and and thrilled, and uh, happy to to meet you for the first time. And and where are you recording from today? I'm recording from my home in England. Uh, I live in Tunbridge Wells, south of London, not too far from Glyndebourne, actually. Uh, the whole area is really uh, very peaceful and very rejuvenating between uh, all the craziness. I've been actually many times, my parents live in Winchester, which is not too far away. I um, mean, you know, like a little distance, but not uh, sure. not too far away. So we, we share that uh, connection also in common. Before we started recording, I was just mentioning that we share a connection with St. Matthew's Church in Ottawa. And yeah. um, I used to be <laughs> head chorister there, and so did you. <laughs> Yes, I, I think the eras might have been a little different, but I was so thrilled to to know that you were the the first uh, head chorister of the girls. Uh, when I was there, it was a, a boys and men only choir, and I was so happy when uh, when the girls were were invited to to take part. Uh, absolutely the right thing, I think, uh, for uh, yes, for 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 all all the right reasons. And uh, yeah, I hope you had as good an experience and uh, introduction to the fantastic choral tradition uh, as I did. And uh, yeah, and and uh, it's given us a good, really good platform for uh, for all the musical uh, adventures that, uh, that that I've I've had certainly, and I hope you are having too. Yeah, I was going to ask you how important the choral sort of background that you have, how it's brought color to the, the rest of your musical experiences and in becoming um, who you are today? Yeah, I think the first thing to say is that it brought joy. You know, uh, that's just that feeling of, of uh, being with other people, making extraordinary, taking part in extraordinary music um, and, and striving actually to, to get to get things right and to, uh, you know, uh, fulfill, I I don't know, uh, uh, an unimagined brief of what what a composer wants to hear, what an audience wants to hear, um, and yeah, just I mean, it was a team. It's a team, um, but your individual contribution is so is so valued, and and I think that's that's the exciting part of, and particularly as a young person, is is that you know you. You you have no idea. You have no expectations. You know, you show up and you get another brilliant piece of music to learn, and you know it's more incredible than last week's. But last week's was pretty incredible as well. Um, all the events, kind of a from a again just getting organized. You, you know, preparing for things, understanding the idea of what what preparation is, uh, rehearsal, uh, discipline. You know, turning up on time. I mean, all the things that you can get in sport as well, I suppose. But I always like to think that singing is, is just being an athlete of the throat. And in some ways, you know, being being part of a team in, in a choir, um, you know, it was a very bonding experience. I had, I mean, I still have, have lifelong friends that I'm in touch with now. And being lucky in Ottawa, where the sort of the, culture of music was just starting to be really invested in um and we were very lucky because many projects were happening there i got to sing on parliament hill for the canada day F festivals we were the children's choir for any of the stuff that was happening at the national arts center um even even shows on tv ontario that were 
you know, using using youth choirs. And of course, once you become a member of a of a children's choir, you're a rarity, and therefore, whenever there's a need for a children's choir, you you, you get invited. Uh, and and for me, that meant that you know there were amazing professional like experiences that uh, that we had, and um, but we had a lot of fun as well. I mean, the, that was the other thing, outside of the singing and outside of the actual music making, uh, lots of bonding experiences. Uh, ice skating on the canal in Ottawa, um, sleigh rides, uh, choir camp, um, you know, and, and lots of opportunities for the young people to do young, you know, chil- children's activities, uh, which, which was fantastic. Yeah, definitely. I feel blessed that I had that upbringing as well. And I feel it brings, it, it has brought confidence to, to my anything that I've been doing in this career and I've ended up on a different side of music, but obviously uh, many people who have gone through those programs have ended up also still connected to music in some way, which is yeah. a beautiful thing. Incredible. And, and yes, I mean, the choir was not just a singing event. It was also, uh, you know, ad- administratively you, your role with one's role within the choir you know, could change from being a, a head chorister to a librarian to uh, uh, to organizing rehearsal times to, you know, um, even, um, I don't know, even organizing parents. It became this thing where where the children started to dictate what the parents did. And that, that was a great sense of power, too, where we had to be somewhere. Um, and so the family followed. There's a great commitment, obviously, from from families to uh, to support their children, and as as it is in most uh, you know most intensive uh, children's activities. But uh, the other thing I would say about being in a choir is that we were exposed to the highest professional standard. Um, you know, when we put on concerts, uh, you would you would have obviously your director of music, who is already amazing, and um, but then if there was an orchestra involved uh, or another choir involved, you would hear how, how even more amazing their standard was. And, and yeah, it was always striving for, for a sense of excellence. Yeah, you certainly learn a lot of the historical components as well, the different composers, the periods of music. Um, you uh, learn that very early. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did you overlap with Daniel Taylor at all? Um, I think when he talks about when he joined the choir, I have a feeling that I was probably in my final year in the choir when he just joined, literally as a, as a boy probationer. And, uh, and so, you know, I was, I was on my way out on my way to England uh, to do my to do my conservatory work, and he was literally just literally joining the choir. Um, but it was his brother. I, his brother and I were were uh, in the choir at the same time. So we, I kind of knew who, certainly who he was. Had no thought that that little guy <laughs> was going to turn into the magnificent singer that he became. What about Matthew White? I can't. I feel like they were a similar similar time, um, but now he's CEO of the Victoria Symphony. So oh, that's wonderful to hear. I, I didn't know that. So that's that's incredible. You know, again, the the well, there you go. There's a perfect example of someone following their musical journey, uh, having begun a certain way, and and you know cashing it out in a fantastically important and obviously uh, well, uh, well-distinguished well position. Um, so you're coming back to Canada. You're bringing a show that, uh, I guess, originally premiered this version, this version of the show uh, of Bluebeard's Castle in November 2021. Yeah. In London. So can you tell me a bit about how this this show is has been reimagined? Well, the... Essential work by Bela Bartok, Bluebeard's Castle, was written at a time uh, when a lot of his own kind of explorations of 
shall we say, emotion, mystery, spiritualism, that sort of thing was going on uh, earlier, earlier part of the 20th century. And um, it's, a, it's a real gift for an orchestra to play because it's fully symphonic and has two soloists, uh, Bluebeard, Duke Bluebeard and Judith. And it's a, it's a real gift for an orchestra to play because it's fully symphonic and has two soloists, uh, Bluebeard, Duke Bluebeard and Judith. And it uh, effectively is based on the story of, uh, in a nutshell, Bluebeard bringing uh, Judith, his latest wife, uh, back to his castle. Um, it's unsure, and this is kind of the mystery of, of the plot, uh, about how uh, willing she has been to come to the castle. Um, it starts with them arriving at the castle and then her in being aware of the actual mood of the castle, which is very dark. Uh, there's no light. Everything is uh, damp. Uh, and she then says, I love you, Bluebeard, but I need to let light into this castle. And so the next journey of Seven Doors is basically a journey through this physical castle, which could be interpreted as Bluebeard's psyche, which could be interpreted as a, a, a sense of uh, a, a, a manipulative relationship, shall we say. And what she's trying to do is break into, uh, into these secrets, almost, that, that he has. Behind every door is a room, uh, or is a, is a view, or is an experience that she then reflects on. And the culmination is that she encounters, uh, spoiler here, uh, she, she encounters the other wives of Bluebeard, um, and the end finds a conclusion where Bluebeard is saying all, all is darkness because he has found this last wife and whether she's part of the the group of wives that he has or whether she has herself been perhaps murdered or there, there's another element very dark element to it this is all kind of conjecture and is very much in the musical sort of wonder of it all so that's the straight version um, <laughs> The music itself is incredible because it is full of emotion. The declarations of, of love and uh, devotion to each other between the characters, between Bluebeard and Judith, um, kind of, they keep the story going and the straight story because you, you then want to move on to the next, you want to move on to the next door. Um, what Against the Grain is bringing to... Uh, to Toronto at the Fleck Theatre, the Fleck Dance Theatre at the end of March, is the version by uh, the Theatre of Sound, which is uh, a little company in, in based in the UK. And the two founders of that wanted to uh, explore the possibility that, in fact, what the castle was, was a way, uh, was imagined as Judith's, shall we say, not imprisonment, but experience of relating to the world uh, while dealing with dementia. And what has what it has allowed is that the context of the story and all everything that they exchange in terms of conversation, because it is a conversation, sometimes stilted, sometimes very full of love, sometimes angry, sometimes defensive, all these things. It seemed to uh, Daisy Evans, the director, and Stephen Higgins, who is the musical director, that Bartok's music allows for this kind of perspective where it could be a, a misunderstanding, or there could be misunderstandings between uh, the characters, that there could be experiences which didn't, didn't parallel at all, but were very disjointed. And 
it has to be said that dementia is a horrible uh, kind of affliction that really uh, dissolves relationships. It, it means that people who are living with dementia find their own literal way of coping with life. And those that love and care them are witness to this, uh, to this journey and sometimes can communicate with them, but often can't communicate with them. And so what happens a lot in relationships um, of those living with dementia is that bridges are tried to be built, usually memories. And of course, memories for each of us have certain weight and, and a representation of who we are as people. For Judith, if these memories are somehow uh, rearranged or tried to make sense of in a, in a new context because of the effects of dementia, she has her own complete existence uh, in, in a way that her carer, in this case, Bluebeard, um, is not able to understand. But he tries very hard to try and bring her an association because in this particular version, Bluebeard and Judith are a long married couple and they have loved each other through many, many years and have had incredible shared experiences, some painful, but some full of love. And actually it celebrates love and it celebrates a long relationship that has gone through many, many different turmoils. Do you know if this version of this piece was brought to life through an experience, a personal connection with somebody that had dementia, perhaps? That's a really good question. It didn't, it wasn't generated by, uh, either of those, uh, either director or, or, or musical director as a, as a, as a, um, a, as a specific encounter. But sadly, uh, everyone generally, uh, who have, who have knowledge of, of the older generation and sometimes not the older generation. Dementia is becoming a really pervasive part of our, society as people live longer as as cures for cancer and heart and and other uh previous kind of uh, faltering uh diseases that that ended people's lives a little sooner as people live longer the the uh, the occurrence of dementia within families is is much greater and from that point of view this is why it's become a really uh fascinating uh, approach to this particular opera because it does in fact reach out and touch many different aspects of not just general living and what it takes to live in the 21st century but also how what what our roles are as human beings in in caring uh, and being associated with with dementia and those who are living with it and and that is for me it's a celebration because it it acknowledges it 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 offers to do anything. It's to make us experience emotions, which we, you know, on on the surface, which we sometimes have to contain. Sometimes our struggles, our our twenty first century struggles, are reflected much better in in productions that deal with uh, uh, situations and everything that uh, are able to reflect who we are in the present day. So I'm not a, uh, I don't disparage modern productions in any way if they're dealing with issues that we all confront with, are, are confronted with. And in this particular instance, uh, the, the theme, you know, I've, I've, I've been very touched myself uh, by the impact that our audiences had, uh, or that, that this presentation had on audiences. Um, it, the, the word of its, intensity and and kind of experience spread like wildfire we had probably 35 people in the audience for the first show and we only had a capacity of 160 uh and we did uh we did 10 shows um no i correct that we did 14 shows and by the 14th show the last the last 10 the last well 10 shows were full but then by the 
the the last few we were we were being asked to extend the run so that people could come and see it so uh, you know it has a huge impact uh, on audiences but also music lovers will be amazed at how Bartok's music can be so refreshing and how it can relate very much and it's not grand opera in the way we're not out there you know giving out big 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 emotions uh just with big sounds it's very concerned with intimacy so i would say that actually this version becomes one of those immersive experiences people uh the the, the reason we chose a theater like the fleck was to not be too large a space and to be able to uh literally with not within touching distance necessarily but certainly within emotional contact just by very subtle action there are only seven musicians it's not a full symphony orchestra the idea of this, of, of this version is that it's intimate that it's powerful that it's clear that it actually deals with those small very small signals that we give each other uh emotionally when we're just talking to each other or having a conversation about sometimes tough things uh bartok's music allows this particularly in this particular ver in in this version i'm thrilled i cannot tell you how excited i am to come and share it that's great i love the emphasis on relevance we, we've been talking about how to keep opera vibrant and the future of opera going in this time of change and transition. After the pandemic, there's been a lot of discussion about this. And by taking a piece like Bluebeard's Castle, that is not a new opera, but changing the perspective slightly, using the dementia element that people are, many people are faced with, is a really beautiful way of creating more relevance to the to the piece to the everyday opera viewer. So I think I think that's a really wonderful and powerful thing. Uh, Let's move on just a little bit to to follow through on this a little bit. Um, the importance of new opera for you in in the industry in the future of opera. What what are your thoughts on on new opera? We're never going to get the, the major impactful works of opera unless we have a wonderful output of opera where of, of work that is that is still searching. Um, I mean, all the great all the great operas that we consider, you know, classic or or important, they all started from a position of being. Well, they, they weren't there before. <laughs> and a composer obviously needs to be uh, galvanized with a topic and with a sense of palette, his composing palette, that will, that will share whatever story, whatever uh, re reflection, reaction, uh, passion that the composer has for a particular story and character, the character's dilemmas, the character's choice of solutions for problems, the characters um, through their emotional journey, you know, become better or they're punished or they're uh, brought to a, a, a confrontation with, you know, with a situation that they hadn't foreseen before. So they grow. Um, this is what we all do in our life. We all face challenges and we all make decisions through logic, through emotion, through planning. Um, but we also have to deal with the unexpected. And this is where, I, I don't know, for me, that's where human life and endeavor and care, compassion, um, sacrifice, these are all themes that, that are throughout history things that we uh, look at, we take on board, we understand why people's involvement in a community becomes very, uh, very important, or people relinquishing power, um, 
or then of course we have the political thing of, of abuse of power um you know uh, uh manipulation of a situation which in someone intends to go one way and because of subversive activity by other people you know tends up to end up uh in another way good or bad and i think that's just it opera is about reflecting our challenges and journeys as humans and composers you know are gifted uh as messengers really for us to experience however long whether it's an hour of of bar talk or you know five and a half hours of of wagner um then we are aware that there are dilemmas that that need to be solved and and composers lead us on these incredible journeys and the best ones started badly they all started badly verdi started badly wagner started badly um uh puccini started very badly uh you know so thank goodness they kept writing um so we need to encourage composers to keep writing to keep you know and and confronting uh uh their own fragility how do we do that oh my gosh okay we need to support them of course we need to support them we need to encourage them we need absolutely to feel that that that's the way forward you know encouraging storytelling now from all our uh common um or or uncommon uh story bases so cross culture um you know uh uh nationalistic um all these themes or or just from community of course some of the most popular operas particularly for instance from Benjamin Britten you know started with very very small communities okay peter grimes became extraordinary but it reflects the very small janacek you know small communities family situations going badly um the new opera by uh kaya sariahold called innocence you know deals with a very very serious trauma in a community and and through her magic writing um allows a voice for on you know disbelief and pain and and society's way of coping with with community trauma and i think i mean that's i what would i say is that her sixth or seventh opera now but it's taken her all that time to find the you know to deal with a subject which is so harrowing that we can hardly even bear to see it on the news but there it is in the opera house i'm i'm happy to say that i'm going to be involved in an opera uh by mark anthony turnage uh in a year or two's time which also deals with a you know a compelling terrible uh powerful relevant um situation in in families and uh i can hardly believe that that i'm going to be involved in it but i'm going to be involved in it because i feel passionate that it needs to be out there um so yeah modern opera in the stories of our time is what it is and using classical opera and seeing where those themes relate to our present day um and i think yes it's not a museum culture anymore we are very lucky to have very high technical and uh artistic design uh uh possibilities but i think in the truth it's just sharing stories and we as performers particularly singers who are burdened with the carrying the uh the words uh and hopefully the emotion as well we have to help composers understand that voices are there to be their vehicles um for that expression too it must feel special to work with living composers on on these on these role creations and perhaps you get some input do you get to input anything when you create a role do you get to say ah, i'd rather sing it this way <laughs> well again yeah uh, i mean it's not that i have a dialogue with mozart but i think my attitude is that every performance that i do is a premiere so it's like um uh, okay this in this new piece that i'm doing this particular marriage of figaro or <clears throat> or this scarpia or this wolfram or or hans sachs 
you know, uh, or Robert Oppenheimer, as I played in John Adams' opera, um, Antony in Antony and Cleopatra. You know, it's like, okay, what can I read in this roadmap of a score and then ask the composer, okay, John, do you really, what, what's your feeling here? And he says, you're, you're interpreting it more than I could ever have hoped. Is, is often his response, which is a great honor, of course. But I'm saying, no, 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 John, what, what, do, you, what do you want? <laughs> and he said, I just want it to be there. I want it to outlive me. I just want it to be, you know. So that's, that's a huge honor, of course. And then the, the correspondence when they're writing is, okay, what do you, where do you feel comfortable? What's your range? I've been listening to these parts of your performances. And so, you know. So I get an idea as to about how to do it. Um, and in there's it's helpful when there are workshops ahead of these these major works, uh, because then the composers can hear what elements can or can be adjusted, or or they may even say, mm, our our feeling for that particular singer is that it's not quite so they can adjust casting uh as well. Which is which is fine because that's important to make sure that a composer's thought is that they they want a particular uh, portrayal uh, to honor what they've written. And the one thing more than 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 anything, and I it's something that I'm still marvel at is that composers live with the words and the story that they're writing about far longer than anyone else involved in the process. Anyone else in the process. Yes, they get input from perhaps a designer or a director or or a singer, whatever. But their own ideas have been percolating along the way and they really do know what they want. <laughs> they really <laughs> do. Um, they, If it's not successful, then it, it could be because they've ignored a part of something or they've dwelt too long in a particular angle on it. But they learn, and that's why it's important for them to keep writing. Um, so yeah, boy, to support composers is is really, I think, uh, every opera company's mandate, um, and any presenter really. Uh, I think just to keep it out there, keep audiences satisfied with what uh, with what might be coming in the pipeline, or say, yeah, that's the bit I like, or that's the element of the story. And so that's, I'm thrilled to, to encourage that. Uh, I love the philosophy that every performance is a premiere. I've heard other musicians say that in, in other ways. Uh, another thing is, you, well, you never know who's listening either. So even if you're in a small town doing, doing something that might be considered small, you should always take every performance seriously and... You know, and not necessarily seriously, but just have be present about it and put your your heart and soul into each performance. Yes. I mean, I think singers forget that actually we're on borrowed time from the time we open our mouth. You know, we're like we're like uh, we're like tennis players where the next injury is around the corner. Um, we're completely dependent on our health, completely dependent on not not. Uh, you know, we're completely dependent on our emotional fabric. We're completely dependent on uh, a number of things coming together. Even the best organized productions can fall apart for uh, for financial reasons. So uh, I celebrate every show and I do because I'm I know that to get there in front of anybody is as i said the the 30 people we did for bluebeard our first time it was such an honor to present that to just those few people it felt like they had given up their particular time it was just post pandemic people were very um nervous about getting back into the theater and you know it was like thank you <laughs> thank you for being here thank you for for you know just experiencing we had no idea how it would be received. We just wanted to give the best of ourselves. 
Well, you can certainly hear it um, in every one of your performances. I've heard you perform many times um, in the past in recital and on the opera stage. So it's really an honor today to host you here um, on this podcast. So thanks again for being here. And I hope everyone will go out and see the show in Toronto. Yeah, it's my hope. Uh, I'm I'm grateful for for a chance to you know celebrate it. Um, and actually, people will learn a lot by going. Uh, not just musically. Uh, it's it's a wonderful introduction, in a way, to how we can all as 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 members of a community, just be aware that dementia is impacting us all. And uh, yeah, we, we need to develop strategies and how to do that. So um, against the grain, Joel Evenie and team have been super in, in sponsoring us to come 